Well, hello and welcome back to this edition of the Pastors Podcast. Uh, I am Bob, joined here with Matt and Todd, and we're coming to you from Maranatha Bible Church, uh, located just outside of Grand Rapids in Comstock Park, Michigan. Uh, we are continuing our series uh, called Coram Deo, and we're looking at the Christian's life and how faith and that life intersect as we walk uh, daily before the face of God. Um, we just finished our series on suffering last time that we met. Um, just to kind of recap that, we talked about how, first of all, um, it's appointed to every believer to suffer somehow, right? Trials, uh, obviously the magnitude of suffering is up to the Lord and it looks different in each person's life. But we are all called to uh, called to that. We also talked about how to have joy in the midst of our suffering. Not only is it a command, but it's possible to to be joyous. We also talked about how to grow in our suffering. Uh, we talked about some of the, the cautions that we should have in our suffering. And then uh, we closed it out with um, endurance to to keep going through our suffering. And so that was our, our last series, Suffering and the Sovereignty of God. And uh, so this week, uh, we are starting a new series, which will be our last one before our summer break. Uh, and this one is looking at the uh, uh, kind of a, a broader umbrella we'll call progressive sanctification. Um, what does that look like in the life of the believer? Um, and specifically honing in on uh, what we would call besetting sin or habitual sin in the life of the Christian. Still under the banner of Coram Deo. Still under the banner of Coram Deo. So uh, how does that look like uh, basically living before the face of God um, as believers, um, those who have been redeemed but still live in the sinful flesh of a body, um, and how do we how do we navigate that? So I just want to take some time before we look into that. We did a series on the uh, sin that so easily ensnares us. We talked about what I think it was Jerry Bridges uh, coined the term acceptable sins. And so just let's hash this out for people. What's the difference between, because we might actually say the same things, the same sins, right? Because mm -hmm. But what's the difference between an acceptable sin and a besetting or habitual sin? Yeah, I think even in the phrasing, that, well, first, we, we know there's going to be a lot of overlap. Um, like you said, we're going to talk about maybe even many of the same sins that would fall into both of those categories. But I think with what Jerry Bridges talks about and what we've discussed before is what are those sins that we cover up or rename or, um, you know, they're acceptable perhaps in our eyes, though obviously God's word would call them sin. And this idea of besetting sins we'll, we'll talk about is this these sins that a believer are just particularly prone to, they, they continually struggle with, they, they recognize that it's sinful, that this is not what God's word has called them to do. They're not trying to cover it up, but it's just that daily, uh, some, yeah, sometimes daily battle of they just keep falling in this area. But it's, it's that struggle, that lifelong struggle versus an acceptance or a covering up of that sin. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to make sure like the, the big noticeable difference, what you said, was the acceptable sin is just that. They're saying, hey, you know, you hear the phrase, this is who I am, you know, <laughs> um, and you can show them in God's word where it says it's sin. And they're like, well, look, what am I supposed to do? And then those who are struggling with the besetting sin are saying, hey, I'm sinning and I just I keep doing this, you know, mm -hmm. how do I stop this? So. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's let's define these terms. I think, you know, the word besetting might be kind of new to people. Um, habitual, you know, uh, might be a little scary to people. And so uh, we want to kind of hash these out, like besetting her habitual sin. So how would you describe that to somebody if they came up to you and, and asked you about that? Well, yeah, I like your term habitual sin. We're talking about a kind of sin that a believer will continually fall back into. So, I mean, every sin, in a sense, is um, is is something that a believer could struggle with, but not every believer struggles with every single sin. So, right. there tend to be sins that we fall back into. They're just habitual. They're they're accustomed. Um, we're accustomed to falling back into those sins. So. Um, you know, we were talking about this earlier, and in his book, Watchfulness, Brian Hedges uh, refers to Isaac Ambrose, who called these Delilah sins. Mm. And he called it this, he said this, Delilah sins, like Samson's Philistine mistress, like to sit on our laps and whisper sweet nothings in our ears, 
but they will betray us to our foes in a heartbeat and cut off our moral strength. Mm. In other words, there are sins that we're prone to, that because of our temperament, we're, we're more um, apt to fall into those sins. And then he says this, these are specific sin patterns that we have cultivated through willful and habitual sin, like deep ruts that furrow a muddy road these vices are etched into our lives through daily routines, self-justifying rationalization, and continual repetition. So, I mean, that's a good word picture, isn't it? You yeah. think about these ruts yeah. that are furrowed deep into a muddy field. Where's the wagon going to go? It's just going to go back into those ruts because mm -hmm. that's what it's accustomed to. That's the path of least resistance. And I think when we talk about besetting sins, or as Ambrose also called them, bosom sins. The, Susan, the, the, the sins that we just kind of hang on to and fall back into, they're like ruts that we mm -hmm. just fall back into them because we're accustomed to doing so. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And just to, to emphasize here, like we're talking about the life of the believer. And so I, I think what people can tend to think is, um, you know, well, if I have this habitual sin, if I have this thing I keep falling into, how can I be saved? Because we'll often say, is your life characterized by sin? Like, are you, are you, are you happy in your sin? And what we're saying is, these people are not happy in no. their sin. And so, we're the characteristic, the the chief difference between the two characteristics are when you have this besetting sin or sins in your life. The non-believer probably doesn't even recognize it as sin, or if they do, they're just grieved because ah, you know, this is taking up too much of my time, or I hurt somebody, or whatever where the believer who may commit the same sin as the unbeliever, but the believer is saying, I've sinned before God, and man, I just need to, to get this thing out of my life, right? And so um, I think oftentimes we can think, man, if I have this habitual sin, then I must not be saved. And that's not what we're saying at all. Um, because just as, as uh, Brian Hedges there it talks about, like it's something that it's just clinging to you, and you're, just, you're trying to get rid of it as opposed to, let me just bathe in this sin. You're trying to soak in, in God's yeah, Word. Yeah, I think part of it, too, is these are the sins that oftentimes we would have committed prior to coming to Christ. Right. So I think that's connected to this, that prior to salvation, we have a propensity to sin in certain areas. When you come to Christ, that doesn't eradicate those propensities. Right. Now, it gives us the victory or the ability to have victory over those propensities, but it doesn't change the fact that there was a habit of sin prior to our salvation. And sometimes as believers, it's easy just to fall back into those ruts. Right. And so, uh, but a genuine believer, as you say, is going to want to fight those. They're going to want to eradicate them and remove them. But they're hard because those ruts are deep. Right. And they go back, in some cases, decades. Um, so that's, that's the, what we mean by a besetting sin. Yeah, I think, you know, we've, like you said, we've hit on Hebrews 12. Quite a bit we did a series on weights and sins but i mean just the phrasing that the author of hebrews the sin which so easily entangles and he's writing to believers mm -hmm. so this is not to say that once you're a believer you just have you're, you're never going to sin obviously we know that you know we'll talk about first john one and the context of that but but it's easy it's easy if we're not fighting this to fall into those ruts and there's just going to be particular weak points in in our flesh and and everyone is you know, granted, you can kind of see patterns in, in, you know, with men and women and their besetting sins, but each of us has this weakness that we're prone to, these habits that we're prone to. So when we talk about that sin, which so easily entangles, that's going to be that first kind of knee jerk of our flesh just to pull us that way if we're not being watchful and vigilant in our walk with the Lord. Yeah, I think a, a practical example that I've used in the past, and uh, you say like ruts, and you know, Jay Adams talks a lot about the ruts, and that's why the Bible talks so much about training for the purpose of godliness is you driving down the road. And I don't know about you, but that's where I tend to find my greatest need for sanctification. I think it's a good way to put it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you're driving down the road and somebody blows through that light and cuts you off as you're going, the, the old man, the natural inclination, is to let him know how you feel at that moment as you're in your vehicle. Now you get saved the next day and you're driving down the road and the same thing happens. Like you're saying, you're not all of a sudden like, wow, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity for me to grow in grace yeah. and love. No, that same reaction comes out because you've been doing it for so long. Yeah. But now you recognize that reaction as sinful. And you recognize that situation as the opportunity for God to be able to 
grow you in that area. Does it happen overnight? Absolutely not. Does right. it happen over the course of time? Yeah, it, it certainly does. Uh, and so that's what we're talking about is that, you know, that getting that out, how do we, how do we work on those things? And I think it's important <clears throat> too to know our, <clears throat> know ourselves in this whole issue of besetting sins. Um, we have to know our temperaments. So this is bleeding a little bit over from definition into diagnosis, but it's critical that we understand our temperaments. I think different temperaments are prone to different besetting sins, right? Right. So you look at the melancholy, laid back, easygoing person, they're not going to be susceptible to the same besetting sins that the um, you know, the, the driven, strong leader, uh, the type A personality, they're going to struggle with different things. And I think you see this in Scripture. I mean, Peter was kind of that strong, natural leader, the type A. You know, what was his propensity towards sin? It was presumption. It mm. was speaking too quickly. It was putting his foot in his mouth. And then you look at, you know, another disciple, Thomas, he was not that strong, natural leader. He was more of a laid back, reserved person. But what sin did he struggle with? He doubt. struggled with doubt yeah. and unbelief. Yeah. And you can even see that in the prophets. You can see, you know, David and Samson, who were strong, victorious kings. They were prone to, to lust and adultery. And yet you look at Elijah and Jonah, and they were prone to discouragement. Yeah. You know, so you see that these, there's different temperaments and there's different personalities. And I think part of this is just really being able to diagnose our own hearts and being willing to say, okay, this is how the Lord has made me. This is how I'm built. This is how I'm kind of uh, inclined to in my own temperament. And so because of that, natural temperaments have natural besetting sins associated with them. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really good because, you know, we, we, someone had mentioned earlier, you know, the, that's just, this is just how I'm built. And we can use that as a fall in to say, well, this is just how it is. This is how I'm built. This is what my life's going to be like. So it's not saying, no, don't go down that road of understanding how you're built, but use it for a different purpose. Yeah. Um, know where to set up those safeties and the, you know, setting the guards up in your heart and all those things. So we need to know that, but don't let that become an excuse uh, in, in your walk that's with right. the Lord, but yeah. use that. Yeah. And that's why we have to be careful. Like you said, like type A personality, right? <clears throat> and so we're, we're quick to say, well, that's just, I am a, I took a test and I am a fill in your blank, right? You're, I'm a GR17, you know, whatever, they, too? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> whatever they classify you as. And so you can see that where the world has taken what the Bible calls sinful and said, no, no, these are actually really good traits. And of course the world thinks they're really good traits because it's sin. Like, what do you expect them to say? Right. And uh, and so instead of that, like you're saying, we need to know the areas that we're prone to. Yeah. And if you if you don't know the areas that you're prone to and you're married, ask your wife. And I guarantee she will give you a fairly perfect, exact diagnosis of some of the areas. <laughs> and uh, just make sure you got enough time to talk. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but anyway, so that's what we mean by that habitual besetting sin. And Matt, you had alluded to this a little bit. What does the Bible say? The Bible actually says a lot about the believer um, and his, his relationship to sin because the Bible knows that believers sin, right? You can you can continually look at pretty much any one of Paul's apostle, uh, epistles and you can see, hey, here's what Christ has done for you. Now here's how you're to live. And Paul doesn't live in a, you know, in an ivory tower. And like you said, everyone is susceptible. And you see that even in the Apostle Paul, like he was susceptible to pride. Well, how do we know? Well, God gave him a thorn in his flesh specifically mm -hmm. so that he mm -hmm. would not be prideful. And so um, we all have those things. And so oftentimes I think we put we put the apostles or other people on a pedestal. And we say, man, I wish I could be like Paul. Well, really, you want to you want to cry out to the Lord three times to get this thorn out of your flesh, you know, and so. Um, so what does the Bible say? Well, I think first John 1 10. So you have first John 1 8 and first John 1 10, and it's two different areas of sin, really, right? So first John 1 8 is saying if you're denying that you have a sinful nature, we would say, or the propensity to sin. And then first John 1 10 is somebody who is saying, like, okay, yeah, so I have the propensity to sin, but I don't, I don't actually sin. So first John 1 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I think the first step personally to really understanding the the idea of a habitual sin is saying yes we and like you're saying we are all prone to this if we are not watchful over that so the first step is being honest and the first step is honestly diagnosing your own heart not specifically that with a sin but generally that you too can fall into this 
because if you don't believe you can fall into it, I think you're already taking one step closer in that area. Yeah, another way of saying what you're saying is every one of us has some sort of habitual sin. Yes. So I think we have to be careful and just not assume that that's for somebody else. Right. I mean, every single believer has a habitual sin, a rut that they tend to fall back into. And so we need to diagnose what that point of weakness is in right. each one of us. And that's where what you're saying is so critical. Know your heart know yourself, know your temperament, know how God has put you together, right? Proverbs 4, 23, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. So as believers, if we're going to nip this in the bud, then we have to first identify what our point of weakness is because that's where the flesh is going to go right away or mm -hmm. that's where Satan is going to launch his attacks right away. So uh, we have to be vigilant. If we're going to get victory over that besetting sin, we have to understand what it is and admit that that's our point of weakness and then be willing to address it there. Yeah, I think the idea of victory, it's what do we need to be fortifying in our heart to have those moment-to-moment -moment victories, knowing that we're never going to have ultimate victory until Christ comes or until we're before the face of the yeah. Lord. So it's putting those things in place and keeping those things in place and not saying, okay, well, I've gotten to a point now where I don't need to be as watchful. Let me move my gaze, my attention over here. Because again, that's that's the moment that Satan is going to tempt us. Our flesh is going to tempt us because the wall's down. Right. The, the guards have gone because they're, they've gone somewhere else. So it's it's putting the, the protections in place and keeping them there, being constantly vigilant in these areas in our life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I like this little this definition, right? And everyone has besetting sins they constantly struggle with, whether gossiping, lying, losing one's temper or lust. Christians do not automatically become perfect and sinless when we are saved. Rather, we will continue to struggle against sin for the rest of our lives. And so it's important to understand, like, every believer has this war that's going on inside of them, right? And, uh, and so that war that's going on inside of us, I, I think oftentimes we forget the Bible says we're actually fighting from a place of victory, not for a place, right? And so, like you said, it will be done when Christ returns, when we go home. Like, this will all be over with. So we can look ahead and uh, and know that this is going to be over with, but that doesn't mean practically that we're not fighting on a daily basis here, even though it can be daunting and, and uh, very difficult um, but we do need to fight. And uh, the fight actually should give us confidence because we're not giving in. And uh, that's where we can take a step back and say, okay, I'm, I've been fighting this for so long, but imagine if you were just to give in. I mean, that would say you want you love your sin and you want your sin more than you want to fight. And, and we do give in at times, obviously, because we're not perfect. But then we get back on the, on the horse, as it were, and, and uh, keep fighting that sin. Yeah, can I read a little bit of John Owen here as he describes this? He says, Labor to know thine own frame and temper, which spirit thou art of, what associates in thy heart Satan hath, where corruption is strong, where grace is weak, what stronghold lust hath in thy natural constitution. Be acquainted then with thine own heart, though it be deep, search it, and though it be dark, inquire into it. And though it give all of its distempers other names than what they're due, believe it not. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say that. So. I, mean, yeah. no, I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> that's so but good. That's so good, isn't it? He's saying, know your heart, mm -hmm. right? The acquaintances of Satan in your heart. Oh, that hurts. That does mm. hurt. And I think this can be a point of discouragement for a lot of people, you know, because I uh, like what you said earlier, Christians don't automatically become perfect and sinless when we're saved. In fact, it's at that point that we realize how bad we are. Yeah. And then because by the grace of God, these things are being revealed to us. We're, we're diagnosing our own heart. We're looking to Christ. And then we see all of these not Christ-like things in us. They just become more apparent. And we can just, we can just get discouraged. We mm. can, you know, we'll, we'll talk a few weeks down the road, just uh, just some encouragements of those that are battling with besetting sins, because there can be a tendency to doubt. Um, but but first, just we need to be overjoyed that the Lord is helping us to recognize these things and the fact that we can classify them as sin, and we are we're fighting against them. We're going to the Lord. We're seeing how to you know what we need to be putting in its place. That should be an encouragement to us because in our flesh we would not desire to do this at all. That's right. Um, but yeah, it's it's this. Maybe just on the outset, 
just to not say, okay, well, I'm, I'm pretty terrible. Uh, or we are, but, um, but it's, it's progressive, right? You said yeah. at the beginning, well, this is progressive sanctification. This is not to give us an allowance for sin, but it's to show the more we go into the word, the more we're going to see that we need to change and the more that the word's going to expose these things in our hearts. Um, but by the grace of God, we have these means of grace to be growing in these things. Yeah, it, it's interesting you say that. I remember, <clears throat> I think it was John Braun of Haddington I was reading uh, of him recently, and and uh, he had said something along the lines of, the longer I've been a believer, the more evil I see in my heart, and it makes me wonder why God would choose me at all. Mm -hmm. You know, And so that the, the longer that you're in the Word, the longer that you're, you're studying things, it, it's almost like God kind of takes all the outward stuff and works on that when you're first saved, maybe 10, 20 years or whatever, and then all of a sudden there's this heart work that starts getting done. And just when you think you've arrived, you know, and then it's like, oh, but do you realize the pride, selfish, you know, going down the list of all the things in your heart? And like you say, that could weigh you down because you're like, man, I, I thought I was actually doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden the two by four comes and, uh, but that's God's grace, right? Like mm -hmm. to conform us more into the image of Christ. So yeah, I, I wouldn't want anyone walking away discouraged. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, we need to, like you say, know our hearts. Um, mm -hmm. And so how does this inter intersect with our, with our faith and, and our life? Uh, we talked about this a little bit and, you know, we will get into a couple specific sins that seem to be, um, I would say rampant uh, across Christianity and, and I would say that they are acceptable sins because people don't want to deal with them. I think most Christians would call them sin, but they would say, what else am I supposed to do? Uh, and so um, we'll, we'll talk about some of those over the next few weeks. Next time uh, we meet, uh, we want to talk about Romans 6 and 7. And I think that uh, those two chapters really, really, Paul does a great job of painting the old man and mm -hmm. the new man. And then how is the new man live now? Uh, in light of all of this. Um, so just for general information right now as we as we end is, you know, just some of those encouraging words, you know, if you are listening to this and, you know, you're in the heat of the battle, right, and you're just struggling, just realize, like, that you said God showing us that sin actually pushes us to grace, right? right? And so we're saying, hey, take your eyes off of your sin, repent of your sin, and, uh, you know, as, as David said before God and God alone, I've sinned against God and God alone. And so repent of your sin before God and then realize there's grace for that as well. Yeah, because you think of, you know, 2 Corinthians where you're talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh. What was the result of all that? As he realized his own weakness, he said, no, my strength is found in the Lord. Yeah. So I, I'm content with these things. Um, so we, we realize our weakness, but it gives us such an appreciation and understanding of the grace of God and our need for it daily. Um, so really a, a good understanding of our heart god is putting us right where he wants us not relying on ourselves, not saying look how great i am now that i'm a believer um no our victory is in him through his grace so uh, I, I appreciated you bringing that up you know particularly in this idea of besetting sins it draws us to god's grace mm. because we need that every single day titus 2 verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Mm. Grace does that. Mm -hmm. So if we're struggling in our besetting sins, as you're saying, it should drive us to the cross. It mm. should drive us to Christ because that's where the grace is found. And so in the end, it's a good thing. Yes, the struggle with mm. the besetting habitual sin is hard. And sometimes we just, you know, keep wondering why in the world do I keep going back to the same mm. sin? Well, mm. yeah, that's a struggle, but look at what it does. It should point us to Christ and should point us to His grace. And th this is, becomes the issue then. Are you doing that, right? In the issue of conquering mm -hmm. habitual sin, are you going to the cross? Are you going to Christ? Or are you wallowing? Are you, you know, going down the spiral of, woe is me, I'm a horrible person? Because that's easier. Because that's easier and that feels yeah. better. But these besetting sins, as you're saying, are an opportunity for us to maximize God's grace not to maximize our strength. So mm, that's a good, good to place it. to be. But maybe to, maybe to prime the pump a little bit for next time, you know, Romans 6, 1, should we sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. So right. we, we can't understand God's grace as just this open allowance. License. Yeah, this license to sin. Um, no, it's, it's understanding our heart. I mean, it's all what we said. It's understanding our heart. It's coming to the Word. It's looking at the things that are in us that aren't like Christ. And it's leaning upon God's grace, seeking Him, but then it's actually doing something. It's the put off and put on. 
it's not just to let go and let God. You know, I don't see Paul talk about that anywhere in his letters, <laughs> funny enough. Um, but no, we're doing something, but we know that it's God ultimately working us through his grace. It's uh, it's the third letter to the Corinthians. That, oh, that's where he had it. So. Yeah, I, I missed that. That was lost. That was lost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's helpful. So next time we will sit down and uh, work through Romans 6 and 7, um, exegeting that and, and applying that. Um, and then we'll, uh, after that, uh, next week or uh, next uh, time we get together, we'll start looking at some specific things. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. Uh, once again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. We will do our best to, to answer anything that you may have. So I hope you have a good rest of your day.